Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Adrian Joseph, and I'm here with my colleague Shane Cassells from uh, Google. Um, I'm really the warm-up act for Shane. He's the main attraction. Um, and what we're going to talk about this morning is really the consumer journey and the full value of digital, and how do we really understand all of the relative touch points uh, to help advertisers drive uh, uh, incremental revenue and efficiency and do that uh, simultaneously. Um, sorry, do, you, do, do, you mind, uh, do you mind moving to the back or something, please? Thank you. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to start with the consumer and play um, a, a video just to set some context, and then I'll come on and talk a little bit about the, the levers of full value of digital, and then I'll leave Shane to deep dive into, into conversions and how that can really drive a lot of leverage and incremental uh, revenues. So I, I start with the, with the consumer and the consumer journey because that's really where you know, we see things like multi-screening and desktops being used during the day, mobile phones on the go, and of course tablets uh, you know, typically in the evenings, well, looking at telly or, or, or in bed. Of course, those are generalizations, but I think the challenge is understanding how people move across these multiple devices and what the, what the impact, what, the, what influence this has in terms of driving uh, conversions, whether the conversion happens to be a sale or some micro conversion type around downloading a brochure or something else. Um, and uh, of course, you know, the challenge for, for advertisers is understanding the relative value of, of each of these touch points. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from a search background, that's what I lead for, for, for Google in, in Northern Central Europe. Um, and search is one of, of course, the most intent based marketing machines on the planet. But Intent is one aspect, but understanding the context of that intent uh, and being able to react to that is a key component of uh, unlocking, as I say, the, the twin goals for most advertisers of driving incremental revenue and reducing, improving efficiency and doing both at the same time. So we, we see you know, that there are four uh, key, key levers when we think about the full value of digital. Um, and it starts with, with attribution, and of course, um, you know, the image here of football is relevant because for many of us, many advertisers that I still see, you know, there's a default to last click as an attribution model. And in some cases, that's, that's right, but I would argue that that shouldn't be the default model. It should be a conscious decision uh, about doing that. It's a bit like giving Wayne Rooney all of the, all of the money on a football team because he's the guy who, who kicked the ball uh, into the into the goal, but not giving any of the other team players any credit any credit for their contributions. Um, and then, of course, conversions. Shane's going to talk about that in, in some depth. But it's really about understanding all all conversions uh, and thinking about continuously testing and improving. So you know, not just of course, you know, our, 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 you might think of Google as just being interested in driving traffic to sites. But actually, a lot of the work that we, we work with advertisers on 
is, is, is then helping to improve the, the engagement on site and conversions uh, on site. Um, and measuring effects, as I say, not just of, of sales, but also of a number of micro conversion types that Shane will, will talk to. Uh, understanding the online to store effects, so how people move across channels. Uh, and online to store could be online to a physical store, it could be online to a call center, and it could be from a mobile device. And we now have some new research that we just uh, uh, released about two weeks ago showing a very, very strong relationship between uh, mobile, incremental mobile uh, investment and how that drives footfall into, into stores. Um, and 13%, we believe, 13% of, uh, of, retail, of retail sales are actually uh, driven and initiated by an online uh, engagement. And then, of course, the fourth area of full value of digital is around uh, bid management and using automation to drive both efficiency uh, and, uh, uh, and effectiveness. So I, I, I sort of say, you know, think that attribution really is really one of these quite complex areas, but I think it's made a lot more complex by, uh, by us, frankly, by, by um, people in the media, media space um, than, it, than it actually needs, needs to be. And it really is about understanding the consumer journey and the individual touch points uh, of each of those. Um, and I think attribution is actually about being less wrong. You can't be right about this. It's not, you don't have perfect certainty uh, in trying to understand which attribution model is right for your particular, particular business. But you can be, you can be, less, you can be less wrong. Um, a recent e-marketer survey um, found that something like 77% of all marketeers believe that attribution drives better allocation of budgets across media and improves ROI. Uh, and in fact, um, of those that go on and do uh, at attribution uh, uh, exercises and modeling, uh, two-thirds of those increase their investment in digital, in digital spend. Um, so really seeing that you know, digital uh, in the mix, when you, when you factor in all of the touch points, uh, actually is quite uh, undervalued in many, in many, many advertisers at the moment. So I said it's about being, um, it's about being less wrong. Um, this is a, a case study that we did with, uh, with On The Beach, uh, again in the, in the travels, travel space. And I spoke about first click being you know, the default model that many of us use. And, and that's fine if you have a one click uh, engagement or interaction model. But On The Beach, you can see, for example, that almost two thirds of their business actually is coming from multiple, multiple touch points, if you look at the, the path journey. Uh, and you know, using, using attribution modeling, looking at various models, testing those to see what impact they would have on decision making, whether you use a linear model, a time decay model, or, or what have you, um, has led them to, to, to really drive return on investment up 25%. And, and the reason for that is because you're shifting media from one source to another that's, that's more efficient. And of course, you could say, well, I'll, you know, I'll keep my media mix the same and I'll get more sales. Or you could re reduce your media spend and get the same. Either way, you know, the ROI improvements um, can be quite significant. Uh, desktop to store, here's a, um, a, a list of, you know, we've proven this effect time and time again. And you see some of the list of advertisers that we've worked with to demonstrate these effects. Uh, if I look at um, you know, the number of, of modeling techniques that you can use, you can use causal relationships. So you look at things like using calls and coupons to measure the effects, or regression and econometric type models, uh, or A-B testing using control and, and samples for normally based on a, on a geo um, uh, sample. Um, the, you know, one or two I'll just call out here. So in the case of IKEA, something like 25% of all of their media influence sales were coming from, you know, from paid search, and they could prove that. Uh, in the case of Vodafone, they saw uh, 27,000 ad additional sales to store at a two pound per, 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 per visit, delivering four, four to one improvement uh, on, on profitability, profitability and return. So, you know, these are real examples. 
of multiple companies doing this. I spoke about mobile and the impact. This is the Carphone warehouse study that we've just uh, completed with them. And we did this with them. They did this across 850 stores. Um, and what they did was just to invest, incremental investment in mobile search uh, over a 10-week uh, period. Uh, and it was a randomized test versus control, a geotest. Um, but what they saw was 22,000 incremental sales in that period at a cost of three pound per, per, per sale, driving this five to one return on investment. So, you know, we, we, we have, it's pretty hard to always get this, but we are increasingly getting the evidence about the true relationships between investment in, in mobile and how that interplays across a number of, of channels. Uh, so uh, bid, bid, bid management, um, I mean, I, when I think about bid, bid management and the complexity just within search, for example, of somebody running, say, 5,000 keywords, of course, for most, many of our advertisers, particularly in the travel space, they're managing you know, hundreds of thousands of keywords. But then overlay, you know, how do you then decide what, what bid adjustments you're going to make for, for mobile, for device? for location, for remarketing, and so on. And the complexity just gets really, really enormous. And it's, it's really hard to expect you know, human minds, as, as rich as they might be, uh, you know, to make the best decisions with speed you know, and, and accuracy in terms of optimization. So um, you know, the tools that are out there, they, they really do deliver incremental uh, reach at lower CPAs. And again, we can show these effects uh, as is reflected on, on this chart here. So I'm going to end on, on this slide on con conversions um, and then hand over to Shane. Um, I think the point of this slide really is to say, um, you know, there's a lot of leverage in making some pretty small, in some cases, changes uh, to conversion rates as you look at these through the funnel. And of course, this is the macro view. You'd want to look at this across devices, across browsers, across geos and across all of the dimensions that might be relevant to your business. But there's huge leverage in making some pretty small improvements. And some of those improvements you know, make, make, make or break some businesses uh, in, the online, in the online world. So with that, I'll hand over to Shane, and then we'll both be on stage to take any questions that you've got. So Shane, thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, two sofas and an already small stage. This is going to be fun. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit, take the clicker, about conversions itself and some of the methods by which we can improve the experiences on websites. I understand I've got quite a mixed audience here. Some of you are investment capital type people and some of you actually have your own businesses. This will more speak to the people who have their own businesses. Uh, although from an investment capital perspective, maybe it'll help you to ensure that you are investing your money into businesses that are taking conversions seriously. So um, the good thing about that point, I'm an analyst, so I spend a lot of time looking at data and people's analytics data. And when I look at people's analytics data, what, 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 what Adrian was just referring to there in terms of the tiny little tweaks you can make, um, we actually look at people's data and we, we model out how much of an impact it would have to make those little tweaks. So from a data perspective, I would say no matter what package you're using, Google Analytics, Omniture, Core Metrics, Web Trends, whatever you're using, make sure you're always looking at your data in terms of what it is you're trying to achieve and what is the bottom line, what's the revenue impact. It's not just about conversion rates, it's also about things like average value of your customers. If you drive up your conversion, conversion rates but drive down the average value of your customers, then you're actually probably going to come out with a net loss because you're no, most likely in a situation like that going to drive up your costs as well. So that's a, a minor little little uh, aside to, to make sure that we're all thinking the right way. What I'm going to talk to you about today is things that should help you with both your conversion rate, but also helping you drive the value of the customers you have by helping them to find what it is that you want them to do on their website and drive them on towards doing that. So I call this open all hours. And the reason I call it, I know there's many people here from the UK, but there used to be a TV show on, in the 70s in the UK called Open All Hours. And it, it was about a character, it was a, a guy named Ronnie Barker, one of the two Ronnies, fantastically funny man. And he had this show, he had this character called Albert E. Arkwright. And Albert E. Arkwright was a very 
stingy man. I don't know if that word translates very well. He was tight-fisted. He didn't like spending his money. He didn't like innovating. He liked to keep everything the same. His feeling was, if I keep everything the same, people will just keep coming back to me because they'll want things to stay the same. And of course, he was totally wrong. And the kind of shop that he had in that show, which was a corner shop, a convenience store that caters for everything, those shops have pretty much disappeared today. And the supermarket age came in and took over everything. Towns have become donuts. The centers are gone. Everyone goes out to shopping malls to do everything together. The world has very much changed. And it's the same in terms of the internet, in terms of the constant evolution of what's going on with the internet. And that's why we must be constantly evolving as well. So what I'm going to talk about with you today, the agenda, I'm going to talk about speed. And I'm going to talk about content. And then I'm going to talk about navigation, conversion, testing. And I'm going to go into a bit on mobile best practices. That's a lot, so I'm going to be going really, really fast. So if anyone wants me to slow down, because I do know I, I speak really, really quickly. It's, it's an Irish thing. Uh, let me know. So if anyone feels I'm speaking too quickly, just let me know, and I will try and slow down. Does everyone get it? Does anyone not feel comfortable about saying it now? OK, well, I'll try and slow down anyway. OK, so speed. What do I mean when I say speed? I'm thinking of three things. Can anyone give me any idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking about speed? Loading. Loading speed, correct. That is one of the elements. That's the easiest element to think of when we think about websites and speed. What else are we thinking about? Reaching the checkout. OK, excellent. Actually, yeah, pretty much. The speed with which the person gets to do what they wanted to do. And the third, I'll give it to you, because it's a bit of a trick question. It's actually really your problem. It's the speed with which we respond when we find problems on our sites, and the speed with which we respond when users are clearly having problems with our sites. So I like to think in terms of Formula One racing, because like, it's a great sport. But I also like to think in terms of Formula One, spacing, Formula One racing, because Formula One racing it's all measured in terms of milliseconds. You can get into pole position by being 12 milliseconds faster than your opponent, or even two milliseconds. And a millisecond is one thousandth of a second. And when it comes to websites and speed, milliseconds matter. And improving our height speed by as much as milliseconds is a big deal. In fact, Microsoft and Google figure that, separately tested, that uh, a 250 millisecond difference between the loading, the loading time of two sites that offer the identical services to a user, they found there was a subconscious uh, belief in the user that the slightly faster site must be better. So there's, there's a, just a 250 millisecond thing. This is a study that was done by a group called the Aberdeen Group. Um, and they found that a one second delay in page load time equated to a 7% loss in conversions, 11% fewer pages viewed, and 16% decrease in customer satisfaction. I'll give you a very simple ex example of that from my own experience, where I wanted to switch my energy over from N power to a completely wind-based energy company, because I'm Irish and we don't believe in nuclear power, and N power is 3% supplied by, by, by nuclear power. The page of the first page for switching took about 15 seconds to open up, and two years later, I've still got nuclear power coming into my home. That's the kind of impact that having just a slow page speed can have on you. It's not that users consciously say, oh, well, what the hell, this is taking an awful lot of time. I think I'm going to go and do something else. Is that you must understand that when a user is looking at your website, be it on desktop, tablet, or mobile, they are going to have multiple tabs open. And they're going to have multiple things going on in their head. And if they are waiting for one page to load on one site, it's not that they consciously say, I'm out of here. It's that they subconsciously click open their email or something else that they had going on. And then they get caught up, and they get distracted. And eventually, maybe, if they even go to the trouble of individually closing each of the tabs later on, they will discover that they were on your page. And they will probably be too late to do anything with you now. So speed is very, very important. Has anyone here heard of Moore's Law? No, everyone has, but no one's going to put their hands up in case I ask them what it is. So Moore's Law essentially was, it was this, this professor in the, in the late 1960s who stated that for every 18 months to two years, it's been shortened down to a year, but he insisted he said 18 months to two years. For every 18 months to two years, processor power, microprocessors, will double. And at the same time, the cost of accessing them and using them will have. Pretty powerful, and he was absolutely right, because here we are today. That is exactly why we all have computers in our pockets today that are far stronger than the things that we had on our desktops only a few short years ago, and that's what's been happening. Now, for websites and speed, I have a law. It's called Cassell's Law, and it's fairly similar thinking, and it's like this. Every two years, the amount of content we add to our websites doubles, 
while our users' patience with our websites halves. Now you think back, think back to the dial-up page and how we were happily willing to wait maybe 30 seconds for a page to open up, although we got quite frustrated even then. And then as time went by and things got a bit faster, we moved on towards broadband and that, and people were willing to wait as much as six to eight seconds for a web page to open. Does anyone know how, how, how much time the average user is willing to wait for a web page to open today on a desktop site? Feel free to guess. I know it's hard to have audience participation at this hour of the morning, but feel free to guess. Three seconds, three seconds. Three seconds is actually at the later end of the scale. Two to three seconds. Uh, this is actually quite old. This was a, um, Akamai did a study on this a number of years ago with Focusrite. And just based on websites for booking flights, hotels, and cruises. Cruises. So we're not talking that many young people on that kind of a site. And even just then, looking at that, the range went from two to three seconds before people, again, not because the person being reviewed kind of went, God, I'm kind of tired of this, I think I'm going to move on, but simply because they got distracted and started to look at something else. So two to three seconds. And I've got, I've got news for you guys. 2011 study by Gomez Compuware, and again, it's been reinforced again this year, they found that actually today on a mobile device, we expect websites to load as fast or faster than on desktop on a 3G connection. We are not a very patient people. I, I remember the 80s with my Commodore VIC-20, and I would happily wait 45 minutes to load a game. But I'm afraid the times have definitely changed. And given the arc with which things have changed, it's not really a big um, thing to imagine that in another few years' time, we're going to be talking in terms of one second and things like that. I actually saw uh, a, a, the CEO of a, of a very big company here in the UK last year and emphasized him the importance of fixing speed. They had about a nine and a half second average page load time. They worked really hard, pulled all their engineers onto it for two months, got their page speed down to three seconds. Do you know what he said to me afterwards? He said, it's brilliant. It's a great achievement. But it's like going from page 75 of the Google search results to page two and nobody looks at page two either. So it's still important to keep working on that. We need to get those page loads down below three seconds. We really should be aiming for a one and a half second rate or so in order to make sure that people are happy enough and don't even realize that we're taking time to do things. Speed is very important. That's why I'm spending so much time on it. So the other side of speed is actually to do with us reacting to things. And this is my formula for how to improve reaction times within companies. And you are all C-levels, and this really is a message to you, because you're decision makers. The problem I find in the vast majority of companies I meet is that the people who are responsible for the website and the people who are responsible for the marketing do not report into the same lines within that company. So what happens is that the people who are responsible for the marketing are tasked with driving conversions. And the people who are responsible for the site are not. So when there's an issue with conversions, there is no incentive for the people who are tasked with the website to help the marketing guys to improve things. So what my message is to you, if you take nothing else from this, I would say that when you are setting up your companies to make sure, and I'm very sorry to the IT folks out there, I know you've had a cushy for quite a long time, but make sure when you're setting up your teams and that, that you make sure you have some developers inside with your marketing team who are on the same kind of targets-based result, targets-based um, salaries and, and um, performance packages as the people who are on marketing. Because then they are incentivized to work towards improving that site experience with them. And nine times out of ten, when I go out and meet, meet one of our advertisers throughout Europe, the issue lies with the site not necessarily with the marketing. In fact, I used to work on the marketing side, and I stopped working on the marketing side because I realized that the vast majority of my problems had nothing to do with my brilliant advertising campaigns. The problem actually lay with the fact that I was driving them to a site that simply did not perform. OK, so that's speed. Content, eight seconds. What do you think I'm referring to when I say eight seconds? Excellent, absolutely brilliant. In fact, it's the average length of time that the, a user will spend on a landing page before deciding whether or not this is the site for them. Eight seconds. Goodbye. Not very long, is it? It doesn't feel like very long. Maybe it does when you're standing on the stage in front of all of you, but it's not really very long. So eight seconds is not long enough for me to watch a 45-second video that explains your business model. Eight seconds is not long enough for me to find the unique selling points of your business that you very kindly buried in a huge amount of text that you are actually building with a robot in mind in the hopes of getting to the top of the search results. Put that text towards the bottom of the page. 
Try and build your content in such a way that you're thinking in terms of your users. Uh, you know the content I made, a classic example of the Tax Advisor website that says, hi, welcome to our site. We like to advise people on tax when they need advice because it's all about helping people when they need advice to be advised about taxes. Means nothing to us. Robot goes, God, I think this might be about tax. And so maybe they can get higher up the rankings. So when we want to put that text in, I don't even believe that works so much when it comes to SEO anymore, that whole business of keyword packing. But if you need to put that in, robots don't actually care where on the page it is. They only care that it's on the page. So just move that stuff below the fold and try and make sure that the stuff at the top of the page, the stuff that a user will see when they land on your site, is actually relevant to them and very quickly explains to them what the benefits are to them of being on your site. And the benefits are to them of staying on your site and interacting with you and doing what it is that you want them to do. And there are three simple rules when it comes to building that content to try and improve that. So eight seconds is the amount of time. And the three simple rules are this. Focus all content on the user. It's not about how great you are. It's about how great you are for them. Focus on the conversion. What is it that you actually wanted them to do when they came to your site? Don't get lost. Don't get distracted. Don't get them lost and distracted. Don't give them lots of different things to do, lots of different call to actions. Ideally, you should be looking at a single call to action that is very clear. And I'll get back to that in a while. So we're focusing on the user with our content. We're focusing on the conversion with our content. And we're focusing the user on the conversion. And this comes back to what I said earlier about Cassell's Law, about how we keep doubling the amount of things we throw onto our sites while our user patient has with us. We need to, when we are looking at our websites, every time you add something to your website, think about what you can take away. Think about what your users will now not need to look at because you've put this in. If you put in a video, that explains very quickly what your business model is or how you can be helpful to them, what will they now not look at because they're interacting with that video? Is there something that we can take away? Maybe that giant image of that girl with the headset. Well, maybe we can get rid of that because it's maybe not as relevant now. We want them to look at the video. We believe that would be a better experience for them. But we're always looking at ways to reduce the content on the pages and to help focus our users on what we really want them to do. And time and time again, I see this experience particularly for technical or new products, new, new things that have been developed where the desire to educate the person on what it is that you have done that is so brilliant, that is so genius from you to have invented this new thing, the, the desire to actually get that across gets in the way of that person actually going on to do what they came to do. And particularly when it comes to any kind of paid search advertising where there's a very high chance that the user found you because they know what they want and that they saw an ad from you relevant to what they were looking for. So if you now drive them onto an experience that says, hey, listen, before you can go any further, we really feel you should know everything about what we do and why we do it and all the rest, then you may actually get in the way of that person who wants to get on quickly and do something. So it's very important that we work on content. And that's the element of helping people to get quickly to what they want to do. Navigation. What percentage of users don't actually buy product or service on a site? because they can't find what they're looking for. 70, you're a very pessimistic man. Um, but actually, you're actually very close. The, the, the worst one of those I've seen was 67%. I tried to get generous, found the most positive version of this particular uh, bit of research I could find it was from a group called Kissmetrics, and they found 50% of sales are lost because users cannot find what they're looking for on a website. That is scandalous. You've got a person sitting at their computer, wallet in hand, credit card out on the table. They want to buy something from you. They want to be a lead for you. They want to interact with you in some way. And they cannot find what they are looking for. And a lot of that comes down to navigation, which should be intuitive. It should make sense to a person who does not work in your business, who is not in the line of what you do. They should be able to very easily find what they are looking for. And that means you need to do user testing. You need to think about your information architecture and the way you lay out your navigation and how you help people to find what they're looking for. But it definitely should be as intuitive as possible. This is a great uh, quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, who, who was the architect of the Guggenheim Museum in, in New York. Uh, for any of you who've ever got to see it, it's a fantastic building. You can use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. Think about your websites. 
Think about the way users are going to use them. Do user testing. Ask them what they think of things. And do testing afterwards once you've set it up so that you can actually plan in those changes instead of having to build sites that you think are perfect and then terribly go around patching them in a desperate effort to improve everything because you never thought about how your users can use them. Classic examples of this. Not every user expects to find things in the same place. Shoes. Should shoes be under women's, men's, shoes, or accessories? The answer is some people will expect to find them in each of those places. Why should they have to only be in one place? Let people find them where they expect to find them. If you do something called card sorting, you simply get all of your top level navigation, and then you get your bottom level navigation, and you put them in different colored cards, and you put out the top level navigation, and you ask people randomly, you can go into Starbucks and do this, and simply say, here's a load of cards, can you just tell me, I'll give you a cup of coffee, can you tell me where do you think these belong according to those navigation headpoints? Can you tell me what those navigation headlines even mean? Very simple, find out that actually what makes sense to you makes sense to them. The worst I've seen on this one, um, DIY.com, it's actually B&Q, and um, they've, they've got a ridiculous navigation system that would mean everything to a person who works in the furniture industry, who works in uh, B&Q, but means nothing to anyone who doesn't. So really important that you, you make sure you learn from their, their mistakes. And then the other thing is search. Has anyone ever seen the film, fantastic film, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Anyone? Yeah? Brilliant film. Small number of people. I'm going to educate you now. Brilliant film by Serge Leone. Uh, Serge Leone made in the 60s with, with, with Clint Eastwood and Eli Wallach and Lee Van Cleef. And the whole motif that goes through this film is there are two kinds of men in this world, my friend. It was made in earlier times when it was all about men. So there's two kinds of men in this world, my friend. And in, in one scene, Clint Eastwood is cleaning his gun. In his, in his room, and he, he hears a noise on the stairs, and he sets up an ambush. And two guys barge into the room, and he's, he set up a little ambush, and they shoot at his cloak, and he shoots the two of them. And then he hears a noise, and it's the noise of a spur spinning. And he turns around, and the character of Eli Wallach is sitting on the window. I'm telling you this because I want you to remember this. It's very important. He's sitting on the window, spinning his spurs. And he says to Clint Eastwood's character, there are two kinds of men in this world, my friend. Two kinds of spurs, in fact, in this world, my friend. Those that come in through the door and those that come in through the window. Now, what we tend to do when we have our websites is we get very focused on the door. And we get, spend lots and lots of time on our navigation. Oh, people will click on this, and then these things will break out, and then they'll click on that. And we spend very little time on search. It's an afterthought. Oh, yeah, we should probably have a search box. Chuck something in there. I don't know. Get something cheap, whatever. And so as a result, we have very poor experiences with search for people. But actually, when I look at analytics, and I mean across all verticals and all markets, when I look at analytics, it is almost universal that the conversion rate and average value of people who search is higher than the conversion rate and average value of people who navigate. It can even be as much as two, three, four times higher conversion rates than you have on navigators. And the reason is because the vast majority of people who search know already what they want. And the majority of people who search have probably been to your site before and are returning back. And that's how they know what they want, and they know you have it. So if you have a very poor search experience, you have a person who was primed, who came to your site, who knew what they wanted, was ready to make a decision, and you delivered them to a poor result. And so they leave. And I, I mean, I seriously have been on websites where I have a product page open, and I literally copy the name of the product and drop it into the search box, and I get responded with, I'm sorry, this, this product is not in stock. And I know it's in stock, because I just came from the page and told me there are five of them. But it's literally a very poor experience. Search has to be smart. It has to be easy for search. Search has to be smart enough to understand that when I say I'm looking for a black woolly hat, what, 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 am, what do you think I'm looking for? A black woolly hat, guys, it's actually incredibly straightforward. What I'm not looking for is things that are black, things that are woolly, and things that are hats. I'm actually trying to tell the site what I want by adding in those additional qualifiers. And so if I land on a results page that has all of those different things treated individually for each word, then I'm going to land on a results situation where, particularly if you're a retailer or in travel or anything like that, what you're going to land on is a page where it's going to be 
thousands of results where maybe there should have been hundreds or even in the tens of them. So it's really important that we focus on search. This is actually a good site. This is an example of a good site, smartfashion.com. They're a Danish advertiser. They're now also called stylepit.com. In Denmark, they're called smartguy.dk. I don't mind pushing them because they're very good. And uh, I don't mind pushing very good people. And so they're using a web a search engine called Solar. If I go and look up jackets in their navigation, I will find 1,366 results. And if I go and look up jackets in their search, I will find 1,366 results. That is an indicator that you've got a good search engine. If you've got titles in your subcategories that bring you to pages that deliver different results to the same titles being searched for in your search box, something ain't right. So you've got to really think about search. And we also have to make sure that our content management systems are actually tied back to, to all of the things that a person might search for that will be related to the product that they're looking for. A, a very large UK retailer, high street retailer, asked us to take a quick look at their site about a year ago. And just if there's anything quick that comes to mind, can we just let them know? And the thing that came to mind was these guys sold jeans. That was their thing. They were really into selling jeans and to young people and that. And they advertised with us on keywords like jeans and blue jeans and black jeans and bootcut jeans. And, and slim jeans and all these ridiculous jeans for people who aren't human, the ones that you can't get out of again. All these kinds of jeans, they were selling them. But on their site, they called it denim. Cool. So that was fine. The problem is, in their content management system, they called it denim. And that meant that a person who came into the site and worked out denim was jeans and navigated down through and found jeans, that was fine. But a person who came onto the site and said, actually, I'm kind of looking for stonewashed black jeans, Sorry, we don't do jeans. There's nothing in stock. Dreadful. So make sure that you're also making sure your content management systems are tied into your search engines and that all the things that a user could search for are actually available. I'm going to hurry up because we're probably running so low on time. The other great thing about this, and Solar is, is the particular search package they're using. Endeka is another great one. Um, what, what they've got here is very fast ability to refine my searches. And so as a result, my 1,366 results very quickly become a manageable number, like say 9 or 10, which is the ones that I'll want. Conversion, what percentage of users abandon shopping carts because they're forced to register? Oh, stop asking us questions. Okay, 40, I, actually, you know, I believe it's actually up to the 50s. 23% is the most official number we have from Forrester, so I'm not going to suggest anything else. I have heard sites, though, suggesting a lot more than that. 23% is the number, and in fact, uh, I, I gave this presentation to an, an agency last year and their clients, and one of those clients, a jewellery company, went away and said, uh, take it on board, that really, we shouldn't force people to register. Here's an idea. What do we ask people for when we ask them to register? Their name, their address, their telephone number, their email address, and a password. What do we ask people for when we ask them to buy something for us, or sign up for, or register a lead, or whatever? We ask them for their name, their address, their telephone number, their email address. The only difference is the password. So here's an idea. Let people do what they came to do with you. And afterwards, when they now are engaged with you, when they now have a reason, maybe they've spent their money with you, or they want you to contact them and to have a better efficient service with you, now on the thank you page, say, by the way, if you'd like us to save that data and maybe not have to go through all of this again, why not enter a password? Now, I'm much more amenable to doing that. And if I bought something for you that's a physical good that you're going to send to me, even more so, because I've just spent my hard-earned cash with you, I want to know where it is. So you can say things like, if you'd like to track your purchase, you might want to create a password. This particular jewelry client took that on board, went back and tested that, and came back to us about a month and a half later, 42% increase in their conversion rate. That's how many people were upset that they were being forced to create an account in order to buy from them. You wouldn't do it offline. So, we don't want to land on pages like this. Oh, go here, go there, go wherever, go whatever, whatever. We want to land on pages like this. One clear thing, we want you to do it, please go and do it. And there we go, 23% of users abandoned because they're forced to register. Finally, testing, I'll sit through this quickly. You should use your analytics, as I said at the start. Very important, you're losing your analytics and you're thinking in terms of what's going to impact my bottom line and prioritize by what's going to have the most impact on your bottom line. And from there, you do some testing. Monotate put this together is just, just some of the most common things that are tested with their software. And of course, you're going to have things like call to action buttons, the color, the words, aesthetically pleasing things like that. I like here, number five, 49% test promotions and offers. 
So it's not just about testing how your website looks, but it's even testing the things that you think will actually incentivize people. If you've got multiple things that you think will do it, test them and see which one actually has the biggest thing. Honestly, a 10%, 15%, even 20% reduction in, in prices will not have as big an impact as offering free traffic, free, free shipping, even though it might cost an awful lot less than that reduction. It's just a mental thing in the vast majority of users' minds. But there's a cost associated with free shipping because you'll probably get lower average order values, more conversions, and your costs will go up as well. So you have to make sure it's worth doing for you. With MVT.com, if you want to learn about lots of different software that exists out there for doing website testing is the best way of ensuring that you improve your sites is to do website testing because then your real users as they go through your sites will tell you by way of their behavior which actual versions of your site are providing the best experiences. So that's uh, one of our Google Analytics certified partners and they produce this site that gives just a cost benefit analysis of the different packages that exist out there. Uh, there's also a very good article by Brian Eisenberg that he wrote, um, he writes it every year about enterprise packages where he goes through his own experiences, what, what exactly he's had experiences with his clients of different packages and why he thinks which ones are the best ones depending on the size of your company. Uh, I, I suppose I can talk to Jan about maybe getting that out for you if you wanted. So okay, mobile best practices very quickly. Mobile, mobile sites, very important that we have a mobile experience that users really want to have. Why should we invest in mobile sites? Well, 51% more likely to purchase from a retailer on a mobile optimized site than we are on a desktop site on a mobile uh, site. And I've seen that carried through time and time again with the, with the people I work with. 85% increased engagement. They're going to stay on the site, they're going to flick around, and they're going to come back. And that's the really important thing as well. They're going to come back and maybe not go somebody else because 40% would visit a competitor's site instead because of a disappointing mobile experience with your site. And actually, the majority of those, I think 66% of those, this was a uh, study from Gomez, I think, the, or it was Tea Leaf, actually. 66% of those said that if they had a bad experience on a mobile, they would actually disengage with you on all channels as a result. So very, very important that we be thinking about mobile. So that's the light, little statty stuff. But what makes mobile really powerful is that it's personal. How many people here regularly or even ever share their phone with somebody else? Nobody. No, you. Well done, sir. You are the exception. OK, not the target audience. The rest of you, though, probably don't. In fact, a very nice question I was asked last year at an event by an American guy was, if you give a person your phone to look at a photograph, is it OK to swipe? Certainly not. We don't like handing our mobile phones to anybody else. It's a very personal item. And that is the very reason that I believe that mobile is not the weakest link. In fact, mobile is the strongest link when it comes to cross-device tracking as the future goes on. Desktop and tablet are most likely to be shared items. When you log in on a mobile device, there is no reason to log out. You are always present on your mobile device once you've logged in. And with things like Android and iOS and the way you actually log into your devices now, it's even let more likely that when you open up a new site and log into that device, a new device and log into it, everything else is going to simply be there and you're still logged in. So when it comes to the attribution across devices, <coughs> mobile is actually the strongest link. So keep that in mind. Even though now it might feel like it doesn't deliver as much as the others, it is actually the strongest link when we come to do the cross-device measurement. So always logged in. And here are just 10 very simple things to keep in mind. You'll get the slides so you can look at them in more detail. But 10 very simple things to think about with mobile. So keep it quick. We've already talked about speed. It's just as important on mobile, if not more important than on 3G connections. Simplify your navigation. It should be clear. It should be similar to what they have on desktop. But it doesn't have to be all of the stuff that was there on desktop, probably because the vast majority of the stuff that was on desktop shouldn't be there either. Be thumb friendly. Big thumbs. The mobile rule of thumb. If it cannot be done with a thumb, it cannot be done. Simple as that. So everything you build on a mobile device must work with the mobile rule of thumb. So keep that in mind. Lots of space around things, big buttons, very easy for left-handed and right-handed users to do things. That's why we want to have buttons across. That. Design for visibility, persons at, at arm's length, but also it could be a very sunny day, and they're walking around in the park, and uh, they can't see anything. House of Fraser's first mobile site, if an item was out of stock, it was a slightly lighter shade of grey than if it was in stock. What a terrible experience if you're sitting in the park, and you can't distinguish between shades of grey. Make it accessible, so your site should work across all mobile devices and handsets. We're avoiding things like flash. 
make it easy to convert. You know, you're focusing on the information that will aid conversion. You're using things like HTML5 in your form fields so that they will speak with the device and give, you a better, give them a better experience for filling things out. Make it local. It's one of the powers of mobile is that you actually have got that GPS data and that mobile awareness. Nothing there. Uh, make it seamless so that the person who enjoys things on one device can still enjoy all those same great things on a mobile device. There's no reason why we should be reducing the experience on a mobile device. And then use mobile and tablet site redirects so that people are deep linked and not always brought back to the home page whenever they go onto a mobile or tablet version of the site. And finally, learn, listen, and iterate. Always be learning, always be looking at your analytics data, always be asking your users what they think by way of things like testing always be improving. The day of building a website and walking away and making a million dollars maybe never existed, but it certainly doesn't exist anymore. Thank you. We probably have no time. Do we have time? Questions if anyone wants to ask them. There's an awful lot of information, so if anyone's got any questions they want to clarify or anything like that from either of us, we're happy to take them. I will also hang around um, outside in case you're not all running off to another thing and you want to ask me a question that you're afraid to ask in front of potential competitors. Yes? Um, thanks for your presentation. This was really a great presentation. Um, I own a website in Turkey, actually the biggest comparison site focusing on personal finance and travel. Mm -hmm. uh, in the travel vertical, we have been doing a lot of things for the last two years. We have been uh, ma uh, making the site much faster, uh, you know, doing most of the things that you have been selling, like uh, creating the good content, etc. And Google put us to number one positions in, in many uh, flight related uh, keywords. Mm. And two months ago, Hummingbird came, mm. and the site with the highest number of links is number one. That's what we observe right now, that's what we feel. So I feel like Google, in some languages maybe, in, in Turkish at least, uh, may be doing something wrong now. That's what we feel, and we've been talking to many people, and many people have similar feelings. So what do you think about that? Okay, I probably should have said this at the start. I don't deal in SEO. Um, so Google doesn't really do that much of sending people out in SEO. I think it's terrible if you have been in any way discriminated against, but I cannot confirm nor deny whether it has actually happened. And I, to be honest, I don't have any feedback on what happened with Hummingbird. I don't have any feedback on what happens with SEO. What I help people is when they get true to their sites, how to make sure more of those actually generate conversions. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I don't even care about paid, guys. Any other questions? Yes, this man there. Uh, hi. Uh, what are the differences uh, when you're designing sort of affiliate marketing websites, so comparison websites or whatever, rather yeah, than absolutely. Uh, so, terminal websites? So with finance is a particular example of where that's a big deal because it's very expensive keywords and so a lot of people go through the affiliates as well. What I find is when they're coming through from the affiliate sites or when they're coming in from paid search or when they're coming from SEO, particularly with things like a very competitive area like finance, you should ideally have different <laughs> landing pages for each of them. The affiliate guys are more likely to have already been very educated in terms of what everyone else is doing. So they're not in a comparison mode. They're not in a research mode. They've done their research. So now they've come through to complete an action. So from an affiliate perspective, when they land on your site, they should actually land on the page, which very quickly drives them towards going on and doing that action. There may be some compliance elements that require you to provide particular information. But what you want to really drive their attention to is doing what they came here to do, because they already made their decision before they landed on your site. And the affiliates will really thank you if you do, because they probably don't get paid for driving people to your site. They get paid for driving conversions. So they'll want you to do it too. Does that help? OK. If there are no further questions, thank you. Sorry, Adrian. It's done for you. Um, I, as I said, I'll be outside here and, or down the back down here for the next 15 minutes if anyone has any particular questions that they don't feel comfortable asking in front of the group. I'll be the guy standing on his own down the back. So thank you all for listening.